1954. Harry Bertoya, we love you. It's the depth of this of the sculpture as well, right? Yeah, the, uh, the diversity. Studio in Valley, Pennsylvania on 16th of February 2012. I am Val. <laughs> That's right. I was a little guy and uh, of course there's a, a photo of me and Harry standing next to this uh, brass melted luster. If you can imagine there was no ceiling in this part of the studio um, so he had full height. Everything was done right here in sections. It was a massive collection of, uh, we could say, jewelry in huge form. Look at how massive it is. <laughs> That's the other Tell thing. us about it. <laughs> Watch your steps. And we're entering the uh, workshop. And uh, we're going to go through here. In fact, this is still his, uh, his welding hose and torch that he used back in the 50s. First we thought we had lost it. Now that's come back to its original home. I did a little jig when I heard that. It's absolutely unbelievable. The way Harry set that in place originally in the 50s is as it should be. We're so happy now it's put back in place. When you look around, I don't think you could believe that we're gonna be open in six weeks, but we are. We'll be ready. It's a beautiful space. I think it's one of Funchess's most beautiful buildings, you know? I have a feeling that historically when you look back the art of the post-war that Harry Bertoy is going to figure very prominently. 510 Fifth Avenue was designed by George Bunshaft in the international style. The building has such historic significance. It was the first glass bank. It was a complete open working space as well. It was like everything new, everything hopeful about American finance and the American culture after the war. It was a time of optimism and innovation. People were glad to have the war behind them. They were educating themselves in different ways. There was an exuberance and a move toward the future. Harry Bertoy embodied that move as well as anyone else. It's so energetic and, and raw. I'm, I'm trying to think about what sort of was going on in 1954. What was he influenced by that led him to this piece? Harry was really on a trend of maybe not exaggerating nature, but magnifying its beauty. He went to Peru, he went to Bahamas. So we have these forms in the 510 piece almost uh, African style or with the little notches and big curves, all very growing. Every angle that you look at it, you see more things. The detailing is amazing. You see the number of sculptures within the sculpture. Harry put them in there to break up the repetition of the panels. How about this little piece? And they're charming. A lot of them are very witty, playing off of the African art, the mass and the shield. 
if we see a little uh, dandelion puff, <laughs> he would make 120 times reality because that's what he saw. To me, imagination is an active thing. I now build sculptures that can move in the wind or that can be touched and played like an instrument. Beautiful. I think that these sculptures provide a way for people to get an immediate response to my work. And that gives me satisfaction. I think the, uh, the cloud piece was one of his ultimate masterpieces. If you ever were in Portugal, in Tavira, and you see these little silver fish in the river, they flip over and you see the uh, reflective silver sunlight from them. That's exactly what Harry was taking on, the uh, magnificence of the shapes and the uh, colors and reflections. This, as well as the large panel piece, went into the same building because they're related. This is more of a uh, sky or a cosmic feeling, and the other is a very grounded uh, gravity feeling. You've got to meet Francois. Francois was, uh, was the one responsible for putting this together, taking it apart, and now putting it back together. When you've got three connections or even one connection that looks great because of its alignment, we tag it, we close it down, and essentially they start aligning themselves. The sculpture will basically just pull itself into position. The uh, 510 sculpture was coated with uh, tons of this. As he's melting the brass on the steel, he's making layers and layers, almost like waves of brass. The luster was phenomenal, almost like a, a moon that was gold-plated. There was always going to be a lot of sunlight coming through that building. Bertoia wanted to create a sculpture that would be sympathetic to uh, the international style. Pouring molten metal over that steel plate would give you an organic surface that would change as the light would strike. So it wasn't a static sculpture, it was ever-changing. This brazing process is not done anymore. But, but take a look at the, the life of this piece. Nobody commoditizes Bertoia sculpture. People relate to it on a very personal level. He really was not deriving his artwork from anyone else's. It was almost like emotions being solidified into the metals. 